So, Eric, are you there yet? Hi. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, hello, Eric. Hi, Damrodo. Hello. Hi, Eric. I'm Rupes. Nice to meet you, Rupes. Nice to meet you, Eric. How do you say your name? Rupes. Ru Rupes? Yes. Okay. Rupus is just uh, a new caller. This is the first time that he's called a few minutes ago, Eric. And so he was uh, describing some experience that he had had with, uh, with Goenka. He's done Goenka retreat. Um, and so Rupus, I have, uh, I have done quite a lot with Goenka. Oh, really? I've been, uh, well, I was in um, Igatpuri uh, at Damagiri for, oh, let us say something close to about three years. So I wasn't there um, all of that three years, in and out. Uh, and that I eventually became dissatisfied with the Goenka retreats and the way that they were doing it because they did the same simple beginning things over and over and over again. And so um, after that, I went to Bodh Gaya. Bodh Gaya. Yeah, since you know Nepal, you know where Bodh Gaya is. And um, I was there uh, staying at the Thai temple. Uh, okay. At that time, I did not know many things that I know now, including that that temple was, in fact, associated with Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, and that the two ways that I can demonstrate that was is that one is that I did a retreat there with Christopher Titnus. I think that it was in 1983 uh, and uh, in December. And then I met a monk from Wat Chulapatan. Now, Wat Chulapatan is a, uh, possibly the largest Wat in Bangkok. And that uh, uh, this monk there was a student of Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, as almost all of the monks at uh, Wat Chulapatan. And so, uh, he was the one that recommended that I go see Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. Okay. It was there that I got a completely different and more complete understanding of Anapanasati. Yes. All right. Yes. So uh, uh, what Goenka calls Anapana, basically they do uh, mindfulness of breathing for the first three days and then they start doing body scanning for yes. the next seven days and that that takes one through step actually is kind of like um not a right way of looking at step one directly into overdoing step three of anapanasati uh, in the sense of doing a, a systematic scan of the body over and over and over again when that's done correctly, it eventually allows the student to experience the whole body all at the same time. Um, but what that, it still has quite a lot of movement, but by then the body is fairly woken up. But that we don't have to wake up the body in a systematic way, we can do it in a more natural way, just by paying attention to whatever comes up. Yes. Uh, but we can think about it coming up in the sense of from time to time, experience the legs, make sure you know what position they're in, but mostly uh, associating with the body that we're going to pay a whole lot more attention to the chest area, to the back, to the shoulders, to the belly, 
what his area is often referred to as the body of breath. In other words, the parts of the body that are associated with breathing are much more interesting than the parts of the body that um, are just <laughs> extra appendages like legs and arms and things. <laughs> All right, and that the reason for that is, is because this is where most of the blood in the body resides. It resides in this area, in the sense of the lungs and the heart and all of the uh, organs that are associated with both cleansing the blood and polluting the blood. And when I say polluting the blood, I'm talking more uh, about the uh, adrenaline glands that uh, get the body ready for flight or fright. Uh, uh, and so in that regard, it's important to know basically how we feel in the association of how all of those body chemicals are affecting the body on the inside. But the way that we start with that is basically by starting on the outside of the body and kind of working in. So you've heard Goenka talk about the touch of the cloth, the touch of the breath, that you can feel the, the, uh, the sides of the body. You can feel the, the rising and the falling. In fact, that's where the Mahasi and the Goenka system very much uh, are in line with each other. But all of it has to do with Anapanasati. Yes. Yes. But that they're, they're making, uh, let us say they're glossing some of the most important qualities. And the reason for that is because they're often uh, later understood within the Anapanasati uh, Sutta. So one way of looking at it is, is that the Gawanka method, they read that, that one particular chapter, not chapter, one particular paragraph, and then they developed their entire process from one paragraph out of the Anapanasati Sutta. And by doing so, they, they uh, are missing some important um, points about it. And that is, is that um, the first thing about the Anapanasati Sutta is that all of the various steps of it, it, it actually states it, that we're going to develop those things as skills. And we're going to develop them as skills while we're watching the breath on the in and the out breath. Now, that the, the watching of the breath um, has a really important quality to it. And I will say this, that I have uh, been told, though I don't remember the reference when I was reading the literature, but it said that someplace in the Vasudhi Maga that one should not try to control the breath. Well, when I was in Bodh Gaya, I was put pretty straight that the Vasudhi Maga is not the suttas and that it's not reliable. <laughs> that this is not the right place to get your information about how to practice meditation. It, it seems like that Buddha Gosa uh, was, let us say, all book and no worm. <laughs> In other words, he didn't eat the book. He just, there's the book and he reads it and then he compiles all of this stuff together. And so he's more like a book editor that has no clue about the subject matter that he's talking about. Yes. And, yes. and that in that regard, that's uh, one of the problems with the Vasudhi Maga, yet in um, mostly Sri Lanka and Burma, but also in the, the little bit of Theravada that is in Nepal also has this issue going. By the way, where did you take the Goenka retreat? Was it in America or in... Uh, uh, a, uh, South Asia. It was in Nepal. It was in Nepal. Okay. Uh, they have a lot of Goenka centers in uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in South Asia. There's actually uh, a very large center uh, for Goenka here in um, uh, it's in Bang it's in Bangkok. There's a 
there's a funny part about that. It's kind of a, a side issue or um, a, a joke. And that is, is that there are many, many students who are in part of a loose organization and that they will come down and to do Thai language retreats here at Watsu and Mok. And then they'll get back on the bus and go home back mostly to Bangkok. And then they'll get together and with those buses to go out to the Goanka retreat. <laughs> and then they come out of the Goanka retreat and then they go back home and they'll wait for the next retreat. And then they'll take the buses and they'll come down to uh, Watsu and Mo. And so there's in Thailand a very, very strong connection between the Goanka retreat centers and the um, uh, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. That's, there's so much that's interesting about Thailand like that, that the Westerners don't know. They think that Kawanka kind of stands on his own. And yet I've also uh, recently seen a video of a Western monk that was ordained in Burma, lives in Burma, uh, studies with those in Burma, but that he's actually given this talk at the Watsuan Mok Center in Bangkok, <laughs> talking about Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. So Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa is not centrally located just in Thailand, but he's very big time in Thailand. Oh. And, that, and that the practice that Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa teaches is more complete he actually said this one time that I would like to be able to teach a retreat so that all that the student know, needs to know, can be given to him in that one retreat. Oh. But that's not the way that the Goenka retreats work. The Goenka retreats work in the sense of just getting the students started. Let's get them going correctly. So it's like that... Uh, uh, where Gawanka wants to do the first grade in the first grade, <laughs> Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa wants to give them a PhD in Buddhology <laughs> <laughs> in their first grade. <laughs> and that the way that we approach that is what is called the natural method as opposed to the organized method. Yes. Now, what we mean by the natural method is basically anything goes or anything that comes needs to be dealt with right here, right now. To where with the organized method, it is never mind what's really going on. Here is step one. You do that correctly. And then never mind what's happening in your life. You do step two. Yes. All right. And so this is one of the reasons why a lot of students have trouble with the Goenka retreats is because it's not suited to what the student needs. It's trying to follow a program. I, for three days, I did Anapanasati off my nose, right? Watching, observing the breath, and it, I felt great. Uh, but in the seventh day or sixth day when I was doing the body scan, mindful body scan, organized mindful body scan, he wanted us to scan from the head, tip of the head to the bottom of the toe right and i was just mm -hmm. doing gradually and i could feel my my there was tension building up in my jaws due to you know the it was because it was artificial that's not how body works you know what i mean so there's still this tension right now a little bit bit of the tension is right now it's still in my jaws like i can feel it a little bit tight okay so here's a question for you and that is um it's actually got three possible answers the first one was, is do you think that doing the body scanning itself created that stuff? Yes. Or two, was it something that would happen kind of on its own new because you're beginning to practice Anapanasati? In other words, they're both two new things. One that is directly that practice of the body scanning or two that while you're doing meditation in general new things come up or the third possibility is that tension is not new it's old and that you have been uh being in a state of tension in your life before but didn't know it 
No, I, as far as I can remember, before I went to the Going Car Retreat, I also used to do some meditation. I think I uh, I watched a couple of Miguel Rinpoche's videos. Do you know Miguel Rinpoche? And then he told to be aware of the breath, and I just I just used to do on my own random meditation, but I had no random observing the breath, but I had no such tensions. And then I went to the retreat. It was pretty intense. Then I could find on my sixth day it was getting stronger. And then, but, and then I tried to go out of the retreat, but they would not let me go out. And they told me, we have already made this today. And I could feel if I keep doing this, I might have a trouble, but I, I right. did it. And then the tension is going away, but it's still there. So that's. Did they bother to tell you step four of Anapanasati in the form of telling you, well, just relax. Yeah. Did they tell you to do that? They just told, just relax, it's just, they just told, it's the, they told, what they were saying to me is, they were saying if it was, you know, some disorder, like, I already had some bad things in my body and it came out and I was like, like, it's, it's very different, I feel it's like a nervous tension, you know what I mean, rather than, because attention, these things are very nervous, right, because concentration, attention, right, and then, you know, while I was scanning and I was, while I was scanning, I was not, they told, uh, so the going car, the player going car's tape where going car was giving instructions. And then um, going car told that work as diligently as possible, as hard as you can, you know, and then in these 10 days, you're going to, it's going to improve a lot. And then when I was body scanning, I was not only scanning, I was like, literally piercing my body. Like I was trying to, you know what I mean? I was working so hard. So I must have done, over, right. overdone that, it. That's, that's something that is. happens with many students is yes. they work too hard. Yes. They're, um, the way that, that uh, I, I discuss Anapanasati is incorporating it directly with the four uh, noble truths and the eightfold noble path. That that's the point of Anapanasati anyway, is to really understand what's going on. So let's look at, first off, right effort, which is one of the elements of the path that most students practice with the, not the exactly the right effort. Now, the right effort is a balanced effort. It's not too much and it's not too little. And yet most Westerners will do one and then the other back and forth. They'll work too hard <laughs> and then they'll get uh, tired of doing that. And so then they'll, they'll rest a while and now they're not practicing uh, with enough effort. And so strenuous effort is not the right way. <clears throat> Step number four of Anapanasati, uh, the word that, that's actually in the Pali has to do with pass, passivity, pa being uh, passive and letting things pass. Now, the word that's translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi is tranquility. Mm. But tranquility misses the, uh, if he had left the poly word in there and described what it meant, it would have been more useful. Because when we, most people also will see Buddhism, um, let us say, as highfalutin, high flung, way out there. Uh, in the sense of uh, approaching or fully into magic. And so uh, this word tranquilizing almost takes on magical qualities. And therefore, because it's got magical qualities, now it's way out there and it can't be done now. It's got to be done way off into the future. <laughs> Well, if you bring it down to the actuality of what that means to relax, it actually means that we need to start to train ourselves with every breath to start to relax. Yes. If we relax, then that, that facial tension, you can do what you need to do 
and that another quality that I think is um, let us say is polluted the actual teachings of the Buddha is, is that in the Goenka retreat especially when they get to the point of strong determination sitting that the student will keep his hands still his legs still his eyes closed those are the three things that they mention but then the student thinks oh that means everything and to know it does not mean the head, that in fact, if there's tension in the neck of the head, you can do things to roll around to get that to relax. You can also do it with your shoulders to move around. But this idea of, oh, there's a certain way to do things and that I've got to follow this exact program. And then you make up part of that program yourself or other students do. Another example of that is, is that when a student begins to slouch, if he notices that because he's watching the body, then he'll straighten up just a bit. Now, not too much, but the, uh, there is a curve in the spine, and so we don't want to straighten up so much that we remove that curve. But the other quality is, is that if we're bent over, then not only is the rib cage collapsed and we're not getting enough air, but when we're like that, then it causes tension in the back because now the gravity is pulling us down this way. But if we're sitting up straight, then the gravity is actually pulling us straight down. And therefore, it takes a whole lot less work to sit up straight. That is very true. Now, all of the stuff about what kind of postures and that kind of stuff, there's nothing about it in the suttas. All of this sitting meditation stuff that you find in various temples throughout Southeast Asia is later additions. All right. Uh, an example of that is, is that um, starting in the time of uh, Sok, this was, by the way, the time when Alexander the Great came into India and Sok was one of the people who fought against him. Uh -huh. It was in that time when we started having a lot of statuary or images of the Buddha, because before that there had not been any, that that was a Greek addition. And so now modern people, they see the, the Buddha sitting still. Well, he's, the question then would be, is he sitting still because he has come to rest? And he's got no place to go and nothing to do. Or is he sitting still because he was told to do that and he's got to practice really hard at sitting still? <laughs> Which do you think it was? If it's the organized way, then we say, oh, he was told to do that and now he's making himself sit really still. But yeah, but once there's an organized way, you know, mind always resists. So it's very hard because that's not your nature. Somebody is trying to force you something. Right. So the actual method, the practice is a natural way. Yes. Now, even though we're going to describe the natural way, generally uh, it has to be described in some sort of organized fashion so as to not miss yes. out on stuff. Yes. But but is to be practiced in um, a more natural way. Yes. Um, uh, I'll, I'll add this to that. There is a teaching of the Buddha called Paticca Samupada, that's the Thai word, or Paticca Samupada. It's translated into English as dependent origination. Have any, either one of you heard about this teaching? Yeah. No, okay. This is actually the second noble truth, and it is part of the practice that we need to, to do. In other words, when, when we get the mind fit for work, then we're going to watch how it works. And the Paticca Samuppada is actually the, the description of how the mind works. It looks like... Uh, Eric, are you still there? Yeah. Yes, okay. 
Yeah, you were sitting so still that I thought that the image had frozen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, getting back to the natural practice, going to the breath, one of the things that we uh, uh, come to understand with Anapanasati uh, through the whole practice is that it is, in fact, breath control. That it's not just wa watching the breath as if it were something on the outside, out of our control. That basically, we need to learn to control the breathing because normally we're not getting enough air. Yes. And so we need to actually intentionally breathe. That's why we call it the long breath. The long breath is going to get some air into the body. And then it fills the belly, right? Mm -hmm. And then the out breath is going to be also used for that relaxation, to actually sigh. Oh. So we take in a deep breath in and then sigh as an out breath. And that out, out breath then actually helps the lungs clean uh, things out, which is collected from the blood. There's a whole lot more that comes out of the blood into the lungs besides carbon dioxide. There's amino acids that are breaking down and other things like that. So the very little stuff, the breathing will uh, eliminate. But if we're breathing very shallowly, then that stuff will actually build up into the lungs and then it backs up and stays in the blood. That stuff that stays in the blood then can be experienced directly as tightness, uh, as uh, tension, things like this that then we give labels to like anxiety. And so by breathing deeply and in a relaxed way, we begin to clean the blood and therefore uh, we are we actually also are oxygenating the mind to make it fit for work. That you probably heard that when a person is just sitting at rest, that most of the uh, uh, energy that's being consumed is with the brain. That the brain, in fact, uh, uh, is a major organ that uses energy, but if we're not breathing properly, then the brain is not functioning very well. One thing that I've noticed in my own past is that if I, uh, I go out with, with family or eat too much or it's a birthday and we have a lot of sweets on the, uh, for the birthday cake or whatever, and I've got a lot of food to digest, that prevents the brain from actually functioning well. So if you have a job, if you go out and have a big lunch, when you come back to the office, you won't have good, good afternoon of, of fulfilled work because the, all of the blood and all of the uh, work is now in the belly. And so uh, we should take that into consideration that I've actually seen that I can't think very well when, uh, when the belly is full, but that um, when the belly doesn't have a lot of work to do, and we're intentionally breathing well, then that oxygenates the brain so that we can make it basically what Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa calls fit for work. So when the brain gets fit for work and we're breathing correctly, now we're setting the stage for other aspects of Anapanasati. And so by taking the right effort, that means that we're not working very tight, that we're actually taking uh, the effort to actually relax. Okay. Now, Goenka has a very famous phrase. He calls it, um, when the mind wanders away, never mind, start again. Yeah. All right. The mind wanders. That's its purpose in life. Just like you would see a cow going around the pasture, finding nice, tasty grass to eat, or a horse, all right? 
that that's how the mind works also, that it kind of jumps or flitters, that uh, in all centuries ago, Buddhists got uh, the term that I think is actually used sometimes at Gawanka called monkey mind. Have you ever heard that expression, monkey mind? Very popular. Okay. That, so that means that the mind is jumping around a lot. That's its normal state. And yet when students see that the mind has in fact wandered away from the breath and is off someplace else, they start to feel bad because they're beginning to have some insight into that they cannot control the mind. At least they've never developed any skills for controlling the mind. And in our education system, we teach people how to control an automobile. We teach people how to control a computer, how to control a cell phone, how to manipulate each other sometimes. But we never teach people how to learn to control their own mind, how to be discerning, how to look for things. And so... When we begin this practice of Anapanasati, we begin to see that, wait a minute, we are actually out of control. The mind will wander away. My intention is to watch the breath and it don't watch. <laughs> and so the problem then is that the students begin to develop the wrong attitude. Now, the important point is, is that we're here to remove the hindrances from the mind. And that uh, you could thought, you can think of that wandering mind as actually restlessness. There's other kinds of hindrances like doubt or um, the mind gets dull because we're not breathing enough or that we want things that we don't have in the moment like enlightenment or other things like this. And so if the mind wanders away and the student sees the mind wandering away, we then begin to want for the mind to be different than it is, and we become dissatisfied and disappointed. In fact, what we're, if we do that, then we're surely practicing wrongly. If the entire teaching of the Buddha is to come out of a state of dukkha, then any time that you're actually creating dukkha in your sitting meditation, then you're not practicing correctly. Does that make sense? Okay, (laughs) so the word dukkha in the Pali language is translated generally into English as the word suffering. And most people will say, oh, I'm not suffering. No, we know you're not suffering, but you're also not in a state of great satisfaction. (laughs) And so this is actually what the word dukkha means. It means it is unsatisfying, it's unsatisfactory that this is not pleasant, it's not pleasing, it's not nice, it's dissatisfying. So when the mind now is cleaned out of all of its dissatisfactions, or let us say all of the hindrances or obstructions to dissatisfaction, now we can develop the skills that we need for satisfaction. All right. Now, this word satisfaction actually has a Pali word for it called sukha, which is exactly opposite of the word dukkha, and that is wrongly translated as the word pleasure. But we'll leave it that way for just a moment to show what we're talking about. That if you can sit in a state of pleasure, satisfaction, satisfaction to be in a state of pleasure rather than the state of dissatisfaction which is not pleasurable. All right, so this is actually step six of Anapanasati, a place that Goenka doesn't ever get around to talking about in the, in, the, uh, in the groups because he's got people doing step one and step a little bit two and mostly step three. So part of the satisfaction is going to be to have the body relaxed. And so when we're practicing the natural West method or the natural way, that means that we're using all of these stages of Anapanasati, not in order, but rather as a symphony, working with them all together. Now, step 10 of Anapanasati 
is is one that's um, it it needs to be practiced right from the very beginning. This is really for the beginner the most important point, and that is what the uh, the sutras call of gladdening the mind or bringing the mind up to a state of brightness. Well, what is that? Help yourself uh, into being satisfied. We want to gladden the mind. We want to uh, not just sharpen it with the breath, but we're actually going to change what we're thinking. We're going to think good thoughts. Affirmations would be a way of talking about it. But uh, uh, a very good example of that, uh, which is actually going to be useful for both of your practices for, from now on, is that when you recognize that you're in a state of obstruction. When you recognize that the mind is obstructed or that you feel bad or whatever it is, you can say, I see that. That's the most important thing is to wake up to these obstructions of the mind, to wake up to anxiety, anger, tension, uh, sadness, fear, whatever it is that we're feeling. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whatever we're feeling or whatever we're thinking, we're normally thinking things that are not wholesome, not useful, not valuable, and in fact are generally dissatisfying. An example of that is looking in the past to find things that are wrong or broken, problems to be solved, and then thinking about the solution. Well, while we're sitting there <laughs> meditating we're not meditating at all we're problem solving but we're not problem solving either we're just sitting on the floor we're not actually solving the problem we're not doing it we're just thinking about it okay so this is a big waste of time yes this is when we talk about not putting in the right effort so it does take some effort. It takes some effort to breathe. It takes some effort to relax. It takes some effort to remember to bring to drag the mind out of its own sewer and bring it to the present moment. And so I generally uh, use uh, uh, the phrase with the students, aha, I caught you. Aha, I see you, Mr. Hendrance. Aha, I see you, Mr. Wandering Mind. Now, when we say that, we're actually chased away the wandering mind. When I say, ah, aha, I see you, wandering mind, then now what we've just said has chased out whatever it was. Or if we're thinking about Sister Susie over there, and then we say, aha, Sister Susie is not here, she's there, why am I thinking about her instead of thinking about what's happening right now? And so, we can say then, aha, I see you, Sister Susie. Aha, I see you. All right. Then you begin to say that with the anxiety too. Aha, I see this anxiety. Aha, I see this tension in the face. So these are various things that we begin to say. This is actually the gladdening the mind that's associated with the waking up process. Now, this waking up process is called, in the Pali, it's called sati. Sati is actually to wake up. Another way of looking at sati is using the word remembering, that I remember that I'm going to watch the breath. <clears throat> and so this is what sati is uh, really about, though in English it's been translated into the word mindfulness. But mindfulness has more complexity, and because it, it, the complexity of it has to do not so much with remembering, which is what sati really is, or the waking up, but it's the paying attention or the looking part. But the Buddha was very, very clear about that these two things go together. One is to wake up, to see, and then the other one is now we're going to start doing an investigation. Now, when we recognize that the mind has wandered away from the breath, when the mind wanders away from the breath, never mind, start again. Well, ha what happened? 
One is, is that Sati just occurred because we woke up to the fact that the mind was not was wandering away from the breath. This is also step nine of Anapanasati, which is the first element of the of the uh, uh, the Sita Nupasana. You know that Anapanasati Sutta is based upon the four foundations of mindfulness called the Satipatthana, and that's the body, the feelings, the mind, and the mind's objects. <clears throat> so so far we've talked about. Uh, the body in the sense of the breathing, step one, two, three, and four, relaxing the body, experiencing the body. We've also now started talking about step nine of Anapanasati. In other words, we can't do step one, two, three, or four unless we're doing step nine. That's the first thing that happens is to wake up to experience that, hey, I'm not watching the breath. This is a skill to be developed. And uh, it also is referred to as experiencing the mind, which means if as we develop that skill, we're going to experience the mind more and more and more. First off, we're going to experience the condition of the mind or the state that the mind is in, in the sense is, is it drowsy? Is it restless? Is it sharp? Is it exalted? All of these things are uh, based upon just ex, um, examples of what it is, but when you're actually experiencing the mind, you may not have any words for it. You're just looking at it. You're seeing it. And then the next thing that we're going to do after we recognize that the mind has wandered away from the breath and that we're beginning to experience what the mind is like, Eventually, that will take us into Paticca Samupada, which means now we're going to not just look at the state that the mind is, but we're going to begin to look at the way that the mind functions. We're going to begin to start looking at the process of the mind. So the way that we need to do that is by um, operating basically with good, wholesome thoughts as opposed to unwholesome thoughts because uh, the Paticca Samapada is actually the pathway as to how we wind up in suffering, how we wind up in dukkha, how we wind up in a state of dissatisfaction is basically because we're not watching the way that we're feeling. And so that brings in step two of the uh, uh Satipatthana, and that is Vedana, or the feelings. But we need to really work with the mind and the body first. And then we'll bring in the feelings, and I would say that that can be done within a week or two. But in the beginning, we start just with watching the mind in the sense of, is it wandering away? Is it restless? Is it tired? Is it in doubt? Is it cloudy? Is it bright? Is it shining? Is it exalted? Is it fit for work? Literally. And so this is the state of mind that we're going to be in. And the state of getting the mind fit for work is done with um, the breathing of getting enough air. So once we do that and start to gladden the mind, aha, I caught you. Now we're going to start then begin working with the feelings so that we begin to intent, intentionally feel good. We want to intentionally bring the mind into a state of satisfaction. This is also part of one's right effort. So to back up with that, we have on the Eightfold Noble Path, the first item is right view. Now, just we're going to sit down and do some meditation. That's one's right view starting right there. It is better to watch the breath than it is to have the mind wandering all over the place. That's also right view. So we're beginning to develop more and more right view in the sense of um, what is, in fact, the right way to live our lives as opposed to following all the orders that we got from our past. All of the coulda, shouldas, wouldas, all the you ought to do this is and all to do that. We're not going to pay so much attention to that stuff as to see right now in this very moment, what's the right thing to do? What is our right view? 
And so with right view as a foundation, then the first thing that we get is this sati. When we do that, we need to start applying right effort, and that right effort is to gladden the mind and to take a deep breath. And by gladdening the mind, then, aha, I caught you, becomes actually another way of saying it. This is really nice. I really like this meditation. This mm-hmm. stuff is good. It's valuable. At least I don't have to think about Sister Susie right now. I can think about being here in this present moment, which is a very wonderful state. And so you can see how we're beginning to put these things together. Eventually, and when I say eventually, that eventuality can be within seconds or weeks. But it's not going to be years or lifetimes or anything like that. It's going to be something that we practice, and that is one's right attitude and one's right attitude then is associated mostly with step um five of anapanasati which the right attitude is actually a good feeling and the attitude is i'm no longer um a victim i'm now a winner that the victimhood is actually how we were raised we were raised as being a victim in the sense of the child is told to do things and the child doesn't want to do them, then the parent says, I told you to do that. You do it because I told you to do it. In other words, whether you want to do it or not is not the point. In fact, it's quite okay if you feel bad so long as you do what you were told to do. Learn your ABCs. Learn your one, two, threes. Clean your room. Shut up. (laughs) All of this stuff is actually puts us in a a state of being a victim. And so we wind up spending our whole lives in this victim state, and we become victims of the government, victims of religion, victims of the educational system, and and the biggest one is victims of business. And when I say victims of business, that means... um, Being victims of business means I've got to get a job, I've got to play with the money, I've got to have more money, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to go buy this. And then business says, oh, well, you can't be happy now. You have to do what we tell you to do, and then you can be happy later. All right. Where did they get that? They got that from religion. That's what religion teaches. You do good now and you later will get your reward. So big business says, okay, we're going to play that bait and switch game too. Yes. We're going to sell you something now and tell you it'll make you happy. And whether it does or not is not the point. The point is, can we sell it to you? Because that's how we get our benefit. Okay. So once we recognize, oh, no, we do not have to play the victim's role of getting our uh, joy and our satisfaction and our happiness from the outside world, we can start to create that right inside one's own mind. That's very true. How do we do Hmm? That is very true. Yes. You have to create it within one's own mind. Well, this then winds up being step five of Anapanasati, and it's under the label of the Pali word is pity. And pity and sukha work together. Not only are these steps five uh, and six of Anapanasati, but they are also two of the aspects of first jhana. So if you're practicing Anapanasati correctly, it will take the student into first jhana. And the practice of Anapanasati, taking someone into first jhana will then be what we call the path of first jhana, not yet the fruit. Because that path is always going into first jhana and then falling out and let the mind wander away again. And then we come back again practicing correctly and starting up first jhana again over and over and over again but as we do this we begin to develop the possibility of sustaining it 
so that it doesn't last just a breath or two, but we begin to sustain it. Now, the way that we do that is by beginning to see what and how it is that we come out of this first jhana without actually developing it completely so that we don't have complete satisfaction, we don't have the complete attitude developed yet. And that attitude that's being developed is the attitude of a winner. The Buddha was known by, as several things. One was the Tathagata, which meant that he's here now. And the other one is that the Buddha was known to be a lion, not yeah. a lamb, not a sheep. He was a lion. He was a tough dude. Yeah. He I had the right attitude. Yeah, I have actually heard a story about how, you know, there was a guy with 1,000 fingers, Angulimala. Angulimala. Yeah, yes. Angulimala. And then they told Buddha not to go that way because he's going to kill everybody on the way. And Buddha said, that's why I need to go because he needs me or something like that. So you are the lion. Yes. yes, that's exactly right. That the Buddha was a lion. In other words, he was not afraid of Angulimala. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's suit the number uh, 86, by the way, in the Majjhima Nikaya. But you're right. making the point for me now. And that is, is that uh, the Buddha was lion hearted. He was strong. He was not afraid of anything. And that much of that comes to do with the phrase, I can do this. This is this is doable. We can yes. do this. All right. That's the right attitude that's developed. And that attitude is also associated then with step five of Anapanasati of that pity, of that can do attitude. It's that, oh, this is great. No problems, mate. This is good stuff. <laughs> All right. So that that attitude is is to be also developed and once we have that strong attitude of being the lion that we feel really successful at what we're doing then we begin to get satisfied with it and now we've gotten that state of satisfaction and we want to actually maintain that state of satisfaction that's the trick is how to maintain it and the way to maintain it is basically if you have wholesome thoughts about maintaining it, if you have good thoughts, if you're gladdening the mind continuously, then you can maintain that state of satisfaction. But if thoughts come in, if the mind wanders away, then uh, those thoughts will carry you out of even watching the breath. Never mind the sukha, never mind the pity, never mind the gladdened mind. Everything just out it goes when we forget and we get lost again. But do not get discouraged about that because that's the normal state of the mind. And that sati then is the very first thing that needs to be developed over and over and over and over again. And this is also part of the reason we'll talk about it um, deeply later about we need to get into a state so that we can uh, constantly remember because the mind is going to constantly wander away. So we, we do this thing called sitting meditation or formal practice or whatever like that. But the main point about this formal practice is to practice sati, to remember, to keep coming back and coming back and coming back, so that when we get off the cushion, we can continue to develop that sati, so that when we get to the point that sati keeps coming whenever we need it. Yeah, the mind can wander away. Yeah, I can do that email, but while I'm writing that email, I can remember to breathe. I can remember to be happy. I don't have to trash whoever I'm talking to. I can be good here. I can do it. Okay. And so our whole life then becomes revolved around this sati practice that has to do with taking a deep breath, gladdening the mind, perking ourselves up, getting ourselves into a state of, um, let us say, the attitude of I can do this, that I'm the successful one here. 
I don't have to compete with anyone because I'm the champion. <laughs> and so this is not a state of pride. This is a state of joy. This is a state of satisfaction. And it needs to be practiced over and over and over and over again. And so this is basically the way that uh, that Goenka is starting, but I'm giving you much more of an overview about how to actually do the practice so that when you begin, for instance, to have some tension in your face, you can say, oh, I see that tension in the face. Let me breathe into that. Let me watch that um, tension melt away. Let me come to a state of relaxation. And so this is the right way to practice. And if you're practicing correctly, then you begin to really like meditation. This is good stuff. I'd rather spend my time doing this than thinking about Sister Susie. Wow, what a problem that is to think about. <laughs> or my job. That when you're actually doing the job, then that's a good time to think about the job. But I'm not talking about being in the office because most people, when they're in the office, they're not doing their job. They're thinking about being at home or with Sister Susie or something. Because they forget to do that while they're at their work, they should be doing their job. But when you're actually doing your job, then do the job, but do it mindfully. Watch what you're doing. And then this way, you're beginning to bring your meditation practice into your whole life. This is where the word meditation then begins to break down. It's actually not even a good word to use, but that's the word that we were given, like suffering and concentration and all of these other words that are really not really what we're doing here. Um, this thing that we're doing, this Anapanasati, this training and skill development is also referred to as Sita Bhavana, mental development or mental training and so this is what we should look at not just meditation but rather to train the mind to gather up the skills that it needs to have a happy life a joyful life one that's not a victim that you're the champion you're the boss here this is your life nobody else is going to lead it to you and by doing it that way, we're also beginning to understand, oh, now we know where all the suffering comes from. It comes from right here. That's where all the dukkha comes from. I'm making it. I'm creating it. And I'm not going to be doing that so much anymore. And so this is how the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path come into operation right from the very beginning of one's practice of Anapanasati. And when we're practicing Anapanasati directly, it begins to help develop the first jhana so that we're in a state where the mind is fit from work so that we can apply the mind and sustain it. Ah, that's the sustainment then of the satisfaction. When we say apply the mind, apply the mind to what? And to sustain it on what? The answer is apply the mind to this present moment and to sustain the satisfaction of being in this present moment. When we can, in fact, sustain this uh, satisfaction, then that becomes the fruit of the first jhana and that it becomes extremely valuable because now the mind is really fit for work. It's really fit to see this present moment in all of its glory because it's vast. There is so much happening right now, and we'll talk about that later, but we got to get the mind fit for work so that we can actually see what's really going on inside the body and inside the mind and outside in the world with all of the causes and effect relationships that are happening at a fantastic speed. And so this is basically then the practice of the Four Noble Truths, the Eight Four Noble Path, along with Anapanasati and the Satipatthana, so that we begin to see how the mind works itself, which is Paticca Samuppada. And the outcome of this is lightness. 
that we can use the word enlightenment not in a magical way, but in a very practical way by seeing it as two things. Light in the sense that it's not, it's not heavy, and light in the sense that we turn the light on. So this sati is actually turning the light on over and over and over again. But it's very much like a strobe. You know what I mean by a stroboscope? They had them at discos where you've got lights on a ball that's circling around or whatever like that. And so um, it actually looks like a series of still images. But then by looking at it clearly, you can begin to see the movements and the changes of the things that are happening between the strobes. So the mind is actually kind of like this, that is all in its darkness and then the light comes on and we take a kind of little photo of it and then it goes dark again and then we wake up again have more sati and so we're going to spend time now developing let's keep the light on (laughs) let's watch what's going on and not spend so much time in darkness and so as we progress through that we begin to lighten things up by turning the light on this is what we mean by enlightenment in the sense of knowledge that we can see what's going on we can see who made the problem we can see that we can fix the problem and we can see that this is in fact the right path that will take us to fixing this problem that we call dissatisfaction So once we get those three things going, we now have the knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. That very path that that we're starting right away of gladdening the mind with the right effort up through right attitude, we begin to see how that actually brings the mind together into a state of unity. That unity then is what we mean by samadhi. It does not mean concentration. It means unifying the mind. Making you one person, not a crowd. Yes, I, I have actually, you know, like on my journey of meditation for like three, almost three and a half years. So, I think I don't, I don't know. Like one can't define the state of, you know, samadhi, but um, this, the, the state where you don't have any mind and there's there's no resistance and you're just there, simply there. And then yeah, I, and then I feel like my consciousness is just expanding. I don't know. Is that how somebody okay. is? Okay. Your job then is to watch that and to experience it, but not to want it or to not try to. Um, going back to the skills that you need to develop that allows the mind to come into a state of unity. And then keep doing that over and over again. A lot of people think, oh, this is nice. What's next? The answer is keep this nice. Because if you start wanting it to be nicer, you've just gotten yourself into a state of dissatisfaction. (laughs) And so when these states come, just experience them without the thought of, oh, I've got to do this again, or I've got to make this one better but rather just sit there with that satisfaction. That's the right way to practice. Okay. So this has been about an hour now. Um, I think that we've given you the kind of things that, that you need to, let us say, not necessarily modify or change your practice that you've been doing, but more to add features to it, to get to begin to develop the new skills that are needed, the skill of becoming a winner, the skill of remembering, the skill of gladdening the mind. And most importantly in, your, in the beginning is the skill of learning to control the breath, to really take in deep breaths, to allow yourself to become oxygenated, even to the point that the body begins to tingle. So because that I tingling want... is really nice. <laughs> Getting the body really energized is really nice. I wanted to ask you one more question. Um, okay. Has there, 
I have I have heard about you know I have heard about very famous sages going into deep state of Mahasamadhi and giving up their body, but you know like they say like you know when one goes to this this meditation practice is enough you know like they can leave their body or save their body when they want, but you know like I won't say I was in the state of Mahasamadhi, but two and a half. Two and a half days ago, I was meditating, and then at that time, I wasn't I wasn't aware, but I was just like rejecting my body, and then I was rejecting my mind and trying to go to that peace space, and I was just trying to be in the space, and slowly I felt like something was coming out of my body, you know, the experience, and then and then slowly I found my body to be very tight, and then I had to come back, and then you know, and then I opened my eyes, so maybe that's yeah, just so part. You need to start working with that relaxation so that that tightness doesn't build up. With every out breath, it's a relax. <sighs> Begin to relax more and more so that the tightness doesn't build up. Actually, the tightness is there, or let us say the the ability or the propensity or the habit of the tensing up is already there. Yeah, habit is there too. And that all of the students will tense up in their meditation unless they're mindful to keep relaxed. And so use that as a skill to begin to relax the body. Over and over again, part of your practice will be that out breath, which is intentionally relaxing. But you can also think about relaxing as you're, uh, as you're doing that relaxing out breath. Think about all oh, this is so relaxing. All the tension in the face or the tightness in the body is just melting away. Med meditate yourself into a blob <laughs> Just, uh. all right eric do you have any comments to make <clears throat> nope <laughs> not the moment all right well we'll see you both later all right uh, you have a very okay. happy new year <laughs> happy new year but Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.